You wake up in a cold sweat. What could it all mean? Was it really just a dream? Or is Bellsprout potentially the fastest Pokemon to do one of these solo runs with? Can it dethrone the Great Ghastly? And we'll find out today. Now just a real quick note on Bellsprout, its stats aren't necessarily spectacular. Most of them are actually kind of poor. That's pretty decent speed, pretty decent attack, doesn't really take advantage of the attack though. Uh, its move pool is rather shallow, and at first glance you would think that its starting move pool is really good, but we'll quickly see why that's not necessarily the case. Uh, and as usual for this run, the rules are pretty simple. Uh, no use of items in battle. Uh, number two is only using Bellsprout, no switching or anything of the sort. Number three, no use of skips, glitches, or exploits outside of badge boost, which you really can't avoid. And number four, no saving between Elite Four runs to kind of congeal a consistent strategy rather than 100% relying on luck and resetting, which isn't really much of a challenge, in my opinion. And before the video starts, guys, I would like to go ahead and say, if you enjoy this content, feel free to subscribe. Uh, we're getting close to 10k. That would be a pretty cool. So if you do that, uh, comment, have discussion. If you want to see any more Pokemon, if you have any thoughts about this, please let me know down below. And without further ado, Let's get on with it. Now on to the run. Uh, right from the start, you're going to see a problem with Bellsprout in the early game. Outside of Brock, Vine Whip just doesn't really do that well in the battles. Even on the very first rival battle, I had to reset several times before I get a win, and even then I needed a bit of luck, and this will kind of be a reoccurring theme with Bellsprout as we go along the video. Bellsprout will consistently need to reset battles even if you hit a minor patch of bad luck. And if you want a shining example of this, look no further than the very first and only mandatory bug catcher that you have to fight in Viridian Forest. You have to almost have everything line up perfectly to get past him. Vine Whip is double resisted, you need growth to even be able to do a respectable amount of damage against the Weedle. And when I was recording, I couldn't believe my eyes how many times I had to reset on this first lowly little bug catcher. And it almost had me rethinking the whole minimum battle strategy. But with enough persistence and thoughts and prayers, um, the Weedle uses way too many string shots and I get past the battle. I reach Brock at level 6, minimum battle is about 10 minutes, Bellspot is really frail, my first attempt, I try to set up too many growths and I get knocked out, that's my fault. The second attempt I realize how unnecessary that actually is, and I don't even break a sweat, Vine Whip just one hits both of his Pokemon and that's all there really is to say about Brock. Now going along for the problems with Bellsprout, more problems arise when you're facing the mandatory trainer battles towards Mount Moon. There are yet more trainers that resist Vine Whip, and the problem's not as big as the first bug catcher, there are some retries where you need to get past the very first trainer here, but fortunately in the middle of the comfy shorts uh, youngster, you get rap, which significantly helps in both coverage and power point management. It won't necessarily be smooth sailing from here on out, uh, but I do feel that we need to talk about rap for just a second. And I would say the community probably considers it one of, if not the most broken, damaging moves in Generation 1. Uh, on the surface, it just looks like a normal move, hits 2-5 to five turns, but where it starts to get overpowered is that once you hit, the opponent cannot attack until those 2-5 to five turns end, and then it gets significantly better when you outspeed your opponent, because essentially you can just lock an opponent out from playing the game if you don't miss the wrap. And I say miss because it does have a 15% chance to miss, and while that doesn't seem like a lot at first glance, it will happen many times in a full run. It's a strong move, and I do feel the need to emphasize it here real quick. And all that is without mentioning that you have access to the attack part of the badge boost, uh, and you have a way to access that from the very start with growth, making rap even stronger than it already is. Now outside of having to reset a few times on the one mandatory rocket grunt in Mount Moon, there really wasn't an issue in here. And since we started with a grass move, Misty is the next logical choice. I do get crit by the Starmie on the first attempt, but the second time it goes fairly easy and that's already two badges down, still at minimum battles. I hit level 18 in the fight, Sleep Powder becomes available, and what's funny about Bellsprout is the moveset. 
What I have here right now is essentially the moveset that you keep for the entire game. It just doesn't really learn anything else. And as you'll see going forward is that although Bellsprout needs some luck in some fights, the strategy that this moveset gives you is really lethal when it works. So let's take a look at it in action. Rival number two is generally a significant early game hurdle, and it gives a lot of Pokemon fits in a solo run, mainly due to that Pidgeotto. But I beat it on my first try, and this is a prime example of Bellsprout at its full potential. Sleep Powder would just put a Pokemon to sleep, and sleep's just absurdly powerful. You can go to sleep up to seven turns, and the turn you wake up, you don't get to attack. So that allows you to get off a sufficient amount of growth to raise up Vine Whip's power, and then once you're set up, you can just start unleashing these Vine Whips. And on paper, it's a solid strategy. Sleep Powder isn't that reliable, and it's where a lot of the luck factor will come in. It has 75% accuracy, and it looks decent, but I can promise you that you will miss it at so many key moments. And on top of that, the Pokemon could wake up immediately or after the first turn. Overall, this one-shot battle is a great example of what happens when things just go right. And you can see how much damage Vine Whip did on both Pidgeotto and Charmander despite them resisting it. And this will give you a great idea of why Bellsprout starts to pick up a lot of steam in the early game. Getting the SSN ticket from Bill was an issue, there was a reset or two, but those are becoming more rare at this stage in the game. I do get Dig, I make my way down to Vermilion. Bellsprout can maintain minimum battles here because it couldn't learn Body Slam even if it wanted to, so no need to fight that trainer. Next up is Rival 3, and what I consider to be the first big hurdle in the game for Bellsprout. And while I will play some of my failed attempts in the background, I'll talk about some of the problems that I had with this fight. And the first and main obstacle in this fight, and throughout this whole run, is, right now is Pidgeotto. To state the obvious, flying is super effective against Bellsprout, and it has a tendency to use Sand Attack, everyone's favorite move. Which means that even if I do make it past it, which I often didn't, I'd be fighting with inferior accuracy because of all the sand all around me. And there are some attempts I get past it, I make it to Kadabra, but it's also a problem. It outspeeds me, and it's super effective against me due to my poison typing. And there is a coin flip luck here. Uh, Kadabra could just use teleport. Uh, the gross raising your special does offer you a little bit of insurance if it does decide to attack. But that really doesn't matter if you're already low by the time you even make it there. Now here's the strategy, and it'll kind of be like this going forward. Uh, so on the Pidgeotto, we're going to get it to sleep powder. Put it to sleep. We set up four gross. It allows Vine Whip to be a two-hit knockout. It's fine in theory, but getting there took many battles. I'd say I retried this fight close to about 20 different times, and things like this don't show up on the time at the end of the run, but I do feel that they are important to know if you want to create a clean tier list and get like a realistic idea of how a run would go. But eventually, you'll get the strategy to go in your favor. I did get really lucky on the Kadabra coin flip here, it decides to use teleport. And on the Charmeleon, you can see how little damage Ember does when you have the gross boosted on you. Eventually, I just put it to sleep just to be safe, and eventually I overcome the battle. From there, I immediately head over to Lieutenant Surge, and it's a good matchup due to me resisting electric attacks. And I do it on one try. I, despite me getting really low, I go down to 4 HP on the Voltorb. Uh, but if anything, this fight is just an example of how powerful sleep is as a status in Generation 1 and not much else. It's also worth mentioning in this run that I fought the two trainers going into Vermilion, Rival 3, and Lieutenant Surge without visiting a Poke Center so that I could dig my way back to Cerulean to save me several in-game minutes. This isn't really exclusive to Bellsprout by any means, but it's just a good tactic to help you save some time if you're wanting to maybe do a red or blue run in the future. Rock Tunnel was a breeze as you would expect, and after that I head towards Celadon, pick up the Pokeda for future Mimic along with some water for the guard, and then it's time to hit the rocket hideout up. This is as good of a time as any to say that I did this run twice, I've tried it twice. In my initial run, I opted to not do minimum battles, and I did the optional grunt that guards the TM for double edge, and I ended up utilizing that during the final fight. There were more reasons for me redoing the run, but we'll get into that later. But it's just a quick note saying that you don't need any extra battles for this run. You don't need double edge. I get an unlucky crit against me during the first Giovanni attempt, but I'm able to make it on my second time, although I do get all the way down to 14 HP. I also learned Razor Leaf at level 33, and this was the main reason for me doing a second run. Let me explain. Razor Leaf looks great on paper. Vine Whip has a 35 base power, 
Razor Leaf has a 55 base power and its critical hit ratio is really high. It felt like it was upwards to 80 or 90 percent later in the game. And you're thinking, wow, wow, Matt, that sounds fantastic. But when you critically hit, understand that the move will ignore your stat boost, whether it be a Geodude against you using a defense curl or you using growth. It'll just straight up ignore it. Now, the problem that arises is that Bellsprout can utilize the badge boost glitch exceptionally well with growth, which also, you know, it raises your special, and all fights are going to revolve around it. What this means is that Razor Leaf would do significantly less damage on a crit than what even a Vine Whip would do normally, and the gap just keeps growing as the game goes on. I ended up taking Razor Leaf for the entire game on my first run, and it turned out to be a monumental mistake if you want to do the fastest run possible with a minimum amount of battles. And I bring this up now because it's important, because here we can see that I challenge Erica for the fourth badge, and there's not much to say about this fight. Erica has what they call quote unquote good AI in generation one which means that victory bell sees grass type and it says hey I got poison powder that's super effective I'm using it even though I'm part poison and I'm immune to poison it'll still just use it so it can't attack me so it's a free battle and this repeats itself on vile plume uh, tangela doesn't even have a poison move but it has awful normal moves uh, so it's a battle you can't lose but anyway the whole point is the key to this fight is getting Mega Drain. It's only a 40 power base grass move, but it's the best grass move in the game, especially for Venusaur if you're not doing a crit build. On top of that, it heals you for half the damage done, which is key for the minimum battle run. In my initial run, I just sold it, and I said, hey, Razor Leaf is the way to go, and that wasn't the case, but I cannot emphasize enough how important that this move is to Bellsprout to keep a minimum battle best time run. After Erica, I pick up Fly, I head over to Pokemon Tower, Rival 4 is generally a pushover, and this time it's no exception. I take it on my first attempt, we use the same strategy as always, but you do get to see Mega Drain in action, and it's not the most impressive, but it becomes really nice to be able to heal some HP back since we're not using any items in battle, and Charmeleon still doesn't have like a flamethrower or anything like that, so we take this one pretty easy. The only other thing worth mentioning is the channelers and specifically the ghost types. Bellsprout doesn't really have a particularly good answer for them and you can set up some gross and you can end up getting a two hit mega drain but I thought I'd highlight this now because there's a certain elite four member later that uses multiple ghost types and is significantly better than what these ghastlies will be. A little bit of foreshadowing if you will. After Pokemon Tower, I opted to attempt to do Sylph Company, which turned out to be a huge mistake and waste some time here. Uh, Rival 5 turned out to be the hardest challenge in the entire game, and facing him with minimum battles at this point in the game was not a pleasant experience at all. I think I tried roughly two dozen times here, and I was just losing my sanity at this point. Just look at some of the footage where I get crit by wing attack consecutively, and I'm not even cherry picking footage here. This happened four to five times in a row, however many times I'm playing in the background. And I even tried to use a couple of rare candies and boost myself up a couple of levels to see if that would do it, but it just wasn't happening. And even if things fall the way I need them to, the Kadabra still outspeeds me and it's even better than it was before. And I definitely, I just, I feel like I wasted a lot of time here and my run time could have been a lot faster as we'll see at the end. I eventually stopped being stubborn. I decide that even though Koga's a poison top gym leader, I'd rather take my chances with that rather than fight this Pidgeot and Kadabra. And Koga takes me five times to finally get a little bit of luck. Uh, the main problem with him is more or less a microcosm for Bellsprout. It's that when something resists Mega Drain and you are forced to not rely on it, things can become really luck based. You not only need to hit your 75% sleep powder, you need to get the coin flips for them to stay asleep, enough turns for you to set up growth, and then you need wrap to not miss and to hit a bunch. You need to outspeed them and there are just times where you don't want an opponent to do a certain thing and all that compounds into reset after reset and while Koga specifically doesn't take that long we'll see where you need lots of things to fall into place in the harder fights in the game later. As for a specific strategy against Koga I basically just put coughing to sleep, set up my gross, regain the lost HP from a boosted Mega Drain, and in this specific case I do go for Mega Drains rather than wraps, because although it's re resisted, it does a decent amount of damage with the time 6 growth boost on it, and it does save a lot of time. 
Uh, I don't think I ever really mentioned how slow and tedious rap can be, but I'll just go ahead and do that now. It's really slow. After Koga, I visit the Safari Zone, we get our HMs, and we head right back up to Sylph to see if we can now take on rival number five. And this time I beat him in three tries, although I'm not really that much of a higher level, and why is that? Let's talk about that. Well, we've talked about the badge boost a good bit, uh, Brock is attack, Lieutenant Surge is defense, Blaine will eventually give a special, but the key here is that Koga gives you speed, and this is critical, this is the most important part of the badge boost, is that now every time I use growth, I get a little bit of speed, and now that will allow us to eventually get faster than our opponents, which makes our strategy so much better, it's hard to state how much better. Specifically, this means that after two uses of growth, I will outspeed the Pidgeot. And at that point, Sleep Powder becomes so much more deadly because you can just control it so well. You can see now that I can freely use moves on sleeping Pokemon, and since they don't get to attack the turn that they wake up in Generation 1, I can use Sleep Powder. I know exactly when they're going to wake up and when I need to use it. It's very powerful. And you can see on the successful fight that although I get hit for 51% of my health on turn 1, I'm able to mega drain it back and generally just plow my way through the rest of his team. At the end of this fight, I do learn Slam. It only has a 75% chance to hit, but it is a normal move and we need some sort of coverage. It has 80 base power and it's just overall much faster than Rap, so I just decided to go with it. And Giovanni, anticlimactic as always. When a trainer is weak to Mega Drain, things are going to be trivial and there's no exception here. I do waste a little bit of in-game time here as well. I go and get Swords Dance, which I don't end up using before I dig out. And it's worth mentioning later when we look at my time for the run and me looking back for myself to see where I could have saved some time. Initially, I thought I'd use Sword Dance, but I ended up not needing it on this run. At this point, we have two more gyms to go, and both of them aren't that appealing. I'm weak to both of them, and I decide that Sabrina is going to be the more scary option, so I'll take my chances with Blaine instead. And as I expected, well, honestly, you never know what you expect from Blaine. Uh, fire against grass seems awful, but you have to take into account that Blaine has some pretty questionable AI, especially when it comes to potion using. But first, let me mention this quiz inside of Blaine's gym. Tombstoner. Tombstoner is a hilarious name, uh, but the red version is even funnier. It says Tombstoney, and I just, I thought it's just really funny to me. Tombstoner, brother. Anyway, I beat Blaine. Two attempts. The first attempt goes downhill when I get put into an infinite fire spin loop and I question every decision I've ever made in my entire life. But the second attempt goes easy enough, and we get our badge. Afterwards, I head to Saffron, pick up Mimic, and then I fight Sabrina. And I saved this for the end, but it ended up not being as bad as I thought. It took me overall four tries, and this is how bad runs went. Turn one, crit, and I'm dead. There's not much you can really do about that. However, the time I made it through, I take a psychic straight to the dome, takes me really low, I survive, and I slowly build up gross, and I don't miss any sleep powders, and I take the victory. Watching the footage back, I probably should have mega drained the Venomoth to be at full health, but maybe my mindset was that it really doesn't matter if I'm at full health for Alakazam, because if it hits me, I'm dead either way, but it didn't matter, and now there's only one badge left. And it's Giovanni, and it's barely worth mentioning outside of just documenting it for a complete video. It was a one and done fight. Doug Trio does take me down to yellow health, but the power of boosted Mega Drains means that I'll end the fight at full health. And that means we're down to just six trainers left in the entire game to be at minimum battles with Bellsprout. Very impressive so far. Overall, rival number six wasn't as tough as number five was. It does take me nine total tries to get past this one, and I thought it was worth showing the one attempt where I make it to the end and I get crit by a flamethrower to end my life and force a reset. It's frustrating, but you really can't do anything about it. Anyway, the strategy for this one ended up being to survive a turn one wing attack, put Pidgey out to sleep, use three growths to get my damage to a respectable damage, and then go from there. The next couple of Pokemon don't really offer a challenge, but as long as you get the Alakazam to sleep, you can knock it out in two hits. I did get burned against the Charizard, but Mega Drain was enough to kind of offset the damage. And although it was a little slow, slow and steady ended up being the strategy that got it done. And since we are doing minimum battles, it goes without saying that we skip all of Victory Road, all the trainers inside of it, but let me take this opportunity to talk about the Elite Four. Just like Cubone, Bellsprout is weak to ice, which didn't bode well for our previous run. It went awful. Uh, Bellsprout has multiple advantages for its playoff run, though. 
The main difference going into the Elite Four with Bellsprout is that I'm at minimum battles, meaning that Bellsprout is only level 48 right now. And you remember that Cubone had to be level 87 to finish the game. I have 10 rare candies stacked up in my inventory, but we'll use those when we need to. I'm also going to do a different format for this run. Overall, you do need several things to fall in place for Bellsprout, and we'll take it member by member this time, rather than full attempt by full attempt since I don't save between Elite Four members, but if you got to know right now, I would say it took me about 40 tries to finally make it through, but there were several hiccups along the way. It took me a little bit, and I had to get some luck stacked up on my side, but we'll see as I come up with the correct strategies for each individual member. But with that all said, let's start out talking about Lorely, or Lorela, Lorela, which about 70% of our runs ended on. And let's just look at our first attempt. I uh, missed my sleep powder, and Aurora Beam damage is just too much to overcome, and I die. This isn't something that always happens, but of course there's always the chance of a turn one crit that will force you to reset instantly. You always level up after the dugong, uh, which means that you lose any extra badge boost speed stats, which means that the Cloister will outspeed you and get the chance to crit. And Cloister loves to crit. It's like his favorite pastime. It's annoying RNG, but at least you're at the first member and it's a fast reset. Now we'll skip Slowbro for now, and it's a non-issue. We'll go straight to Jinx. And just like the rest of Lorelai's Pokemon, critical hits will happen, but this is also the time where Freeze Chance also comes into play, and Generation 1, uh, Freeze is worse than Death, so both of those will force a reset. And then the last Pokemon is Lapras, and you guessed it. Uh, it also loves to critically hit, and remember that critical hits bypass any boost and will straight up murder you in one hit. Blizzard also has a 10% chance to freeze, and that will also end your run as well, just the same as Jinx. And with that said, let's look at the final run attempt where I get past it. This isn't the only time I made it past it, obviously, but overall I opted to stay at level 48 for these first battles due to needing less experience to level up. Uh, and with Dugong, a non-critical Aurora Beam will not kill you in one hit. You'll survive with about sub-30 HP, and there's a chance for it to use Rest since it's psychic and quote-unquote super effective. And in this final run, I get the Rest, but it's insignificant. After a successful sleep powder, it takes one badge boosted growth to outspeed it, and the second one will get you into a range to where Mega Drain can two shot it. You won't always two shot it, but we do here. And at this point, you're rolling the dice, you hit level 49, and Cloister will outspeed you, so that means it's gonna get two Aurora Beans off, two Mega Drains will kill it. I guess if you wanted to be super safe, you could put it to sleep, but I just go for the straight two Mega Drains, and in, on this occasion it doesn't crit, and I get past it. And I didn't mention Slowbro earlier, because it can't beat you. It'll always use Amnesia due to it being a psychic move, and it doesn't actually have an ice move of its own despite being on the ice trainer's team, and I find that it's optimal to go ahead and do a turn one Mega Drain, get it low enough to where when it starts using Amnesia, it's not... You don't have to use too many extra Mega Drains. And this is your opportunity to set up your final four gross for the last two Pokemon. So I'll go ahead and do that here before knocking Slowbro out. Now next up is Jinx. And at this point of the runs where I've already tried like 40 times, uh, I like to go ahead and be safe. Go ahead and take the 75% chance Sleep Powder and avoid any further crit or freezing chance risk. And I think Mega Drain would be also be a two hit, but I just use the Slam twice and I move on to the last Pokemon. And I treat Lapras exactly the same way. I'm gonna put it to sleep rather than chancing the lucky crits. And here I use Slam to do just a small amount of damage to it because Mega Drain will not exactly one hit it and I don't want it to get low enough to start using potions on it. So I just chip it down just a little bit, use a Mega Drain, knock it out, and overall that's the fight. Now it does rely on some luck, mainly from the first two Pokemon, they're really annoying. But after that, only crits and only freezes will knock you out. And it happens a lot more than you'd think, so I just put them to sleep and be done with it. After the fight, you hit level 50. Now next, it's on to Bruno, and you would think this would be an easy fight. And you would be exactly right, because he's just not very good. It's Bruno. At this point in the run, I had fought him a lot, and I never lost a single time. Never even came close to losing. And at this point, I'm comfortable enough to not even put the Onyx to sleep. I don't even know if you need 6 gross, but you don't level up during this fight, so you can just 6 gross, and then one-shot everything but the Machamp, 
and you hit a nice level 51 after the battle's over. No strategy, it's Bruno. Third up in the Elite Four is Agatha, and you would think that I'd have a lot of problems here, but I consistently beat her on my attempts that I made it to her to get to the end of the game for those tries. And I will say that it's extremely tedious though. You'll notice that I went into Laura Lee battle at level 48 to get more levels, so every single time that you make it to Agatha, I use anywhere from 6 to 8 of my rare candies depending on what kind of strategy I was doing. Then I have to use an elixir. And in the final battle, I'm going to be level 57, but some of these attempts I'm going to be level 59, some of them I'm going to be level 58. I'm just trying different stuff and seeing what I can do to get a level. But the point is you have to do that every time you make it to it, and it's very tedious. And this is also the point, something else you have to do every time, I replace Slam with Mimic, because every single one of her Pokemon resists Mega Drain, and Slam doesn't affect Ghost types. On top of that, the Ghosts double resist Mega Drain. And it might be worth noting that I actually beat Agatha on my first try, but let's take a look at some of the failed attempts to see what can really cost you, and I'm sure you already know. On the worst case scenario, Gengar will be its usual annoying self. You have to avoid Confuse Rays, Self Damage, Hypnosis, Dream Meter, and like with most runs, Nightshade is going to be the preferable move that you really want to see. But on this one, I get hit with all of them. And the main idea is that you want to outspeed the Gengar eventually, and you want to mimic Dream Eater since we have access to Sleep Powder. It's a psychic type move, and it will take you several turns to get all this set up and that's where a lot of the luck's going to come in for this run fortunately gengar is the biggest hurdle and every other member of the team isn't really as much as an issue as it so if you can pull off this first initial setup you'll usually make it past agatha and outside of these early pokemon golbat and gengar taking me out i do pick up a string of bad luck and get knocked out late in the run to haunter right here uh but it only happened the one time now let's actually take a look at the final run here. We actually start out pretty awful. We get turn one Confuse Ray, I miss the Sleep Powder, and then fortunately Agatha goes for the Nightshade. I break out of the Confusion, I get the Sleep Off, and at this point you need three Gross to be able to outspeed the Gengar. And if it's still asleep at that point, you can get off your Mimic, you can take its Dream Eater, and in this run it was still asleep even after that. So I just, instead of going for another growth, maybe to outspeed the last Gengar, I went ahead and went for Dream Eater because I knew that it's better just to get rid of this thing now and not tempt it. Don't play with your food. Now Golbat is the second most annoying Pokemon on the team and that's mainly due to Haze. If you miss your sleep chance and it gets off a of Haze, then things get significantly more difficult due to the fact that you'll no longer be outspeeding anything. And I actually take a huge risk in this fight. Uh, I put it to sleep and I set up three more growths. I just... Three more gross. I guess I'm just feeling really confident or I'm really tired in this footage. I don't know, but I finally used Dream Eater. And it is worth noting that you need four total gross to outspeed the last Gengar, but that one's not generally as tough as the first one. It's just higher level, but the move set is worse. And the only thing I can think of is that since I was trying this final fight at level 57 to see if I could level up here, maybe I figured I'd need some extra gross to be faster. I couldn't really say. I can't speak for my past self. At this point in the fight, if you make it this far, you outspeed everything, and it's just a matter of hitting that 75% sleep powder chance and the Pokemon staying asleep for at least one turn, which is usually happens. Haunter, Arbok, and Gengar all get put to sleep with no misses and stay asleep for a turn, meaning that Dream Eater, one hit knockout, and they all go down. And notice that I still don't level up on this fight. I tried it at level 59, 58, and 57. Uh, this specific level 57 when I was 190 experience away from leveling up, and that was kind of frustrating. When it comes to Lance, there's one way to lose this fight. And I'll go into more detail as to why, but the Gyarados is your only hurdle. It loves to wake up from sleep, and more importantly, Gyarados' favorite pastime is to critically hit you with a Hyper Beam on turn 1, which it does. In the fourth and final time that I had to face Lance, Gyarados finally cooperates, but Mega Drain still doesn't do a ton of damage, even though it's neutral. And in hindsight, maybe I should have took Hyper Beam from him with Mimic, but I'm able to slowly chip away and make it past it. Now earlier I said Gyarados was the only hurdle, and why is that? It's because of the good old fashioned good AI. And like I previously mentioned, 
the opponent will always go for super effective moves if it has them regardless of if they actually make sense or do any damage and in the case of the two dragonairs uh, agility it's a psychic move it doesn't do any damage doesn't do anything to me but it's psychic type and i'm poisoned so they will use it every single turn so you can do whatever you want i can fully set up every growth right here and you can sweep the fight really easy now i do make a monumental huge mistake that cost me a lot of time here but i think it's really hilarious and it was just a funny way to win a fight so i set up my growths and normally the consistent strategy here is that i will mimic slam from the dragonair since the dragonite will double resist mega drain but I get a phone call, or it's late, or it's just something goes down, I'm not really paying much attention, and I mimic agility on accident, meaning that I only have the one attacking move in Mega Drain. Now rather than reset, I'm frustrated here, I just go ahead and boost myself six times with the growth, and three times with the agility, so I'm nine times boosted here. And at this point, Bellsprout might as well be called Mewtwo Sprout, because he has so many stats, I've been boosted to the moon and back. And Aerodactyl can be a concern, but I'm just, I'm so boosted, Mega Drains just obliterates him to the Shadow Realm. And here's where the funny part comes in. I only have Mega Drain, I'm limited in how many uses I have. Uh, I hit the range where Lance uses a Hyper Potion, unfortunately, and I run out of Mega Drains. This means, at this point, I have to use 34 turns worth of growth, 7 turns of agility, and about 12 turns of Sleep Powder, and then, and only then, can I go for a Struggle Strategy. And it's just really hilarious that this actually worked. And if I saved between Elite Four members, I would have definitely reset here and saved minutes upon minutes of time. But since it was rare for me to make it this far and actually get a chance against the champion, I had to keep this one. And just watch the footage of Bellsprout using Struggle 30 times on a level 62 Dragonite that has maximum barrier set up. And these situations are honestly just why I enjoy running the game, why I still have fun playing it. The last battle wasn't overly difficult. It only took me a couple of tries. At this point in the game, you know what to expect. Rival number 5 and 6 are basically the exact same. He's just a little bit higher level now. You can see a little bit of my strategy in this failed attempt, but the sky attack damage from Pidgeot is just way too much, and that's really the hurdle in this fight. And in the winning battle, Pidgeot outspeeds, starts off with Mirror Move, I got lucky here. It fails because I didn't use anything. It can't mirror what I haven't used yet. So I thought it was thematically appropriate for Bellsprout since it has depended on luck for a lot of the run. And the two keys to this fight is getting Pidgeot to stay asleep long enough for you to get some gross to outspeed it. It only looks like it takes two gross to outspeed it, but in the footage here it looks like I actually I'm a madman. I set up the full six gross here for some reason. And whatever. Uh, we did it. The second one is that you have to mimic a move that can deal with the dreaded tanky Eggman and ultimately the Charizard which is going to double resist your main move Mega Drain with its fire and flying typing. Eventually I'm able to heal up the early game uh, wing attack damage with Mega Drain and eventually he uses a full restore and after some chip damage I finish it off with a sky attack which tangent here sky attack is an awful move but it's the best thing you can take here next up is alakazam and perhaps my past self made the correct call setting up all those gross on pidgeot because that allows me to outspeed it so i can slam the kazam and it turns out to be the correct call i guess uh not much to say here other than notice the difference in a critical hit mega drain compared to a regular win and that's kind of why Razor Leaf is way worse on Bellsprout in a nutshell. At this point he sends in Rhydon to the Shadow Realm. He's, I'm six times boosted at this point. He doesn't stand a chance. He's bonked. I spend a turn putting Executor to sleep before he can attempt to do the same to me because he's really annoying. I charge up a Sky Attack and it's super effective. It's enough to one hit it. Then he brings in a Gyarados of his own, and at this point I'm worried about it. I don't like Gyarados. It's a very I'm worried about that critical hit Hyper Beam. He loves it. So I go for the sleep on him as well. I connect with it. It does take two hits from a boosted Mega Drain, but he doesn't wake up. It doesn't matter. Uh, it goes down. And then something kind of scary happens here. I remember I tried this run about 40 something tries. So I was losing it at this point. I level up to 63, 
at the end of Gyarados, which means I lost all of my badge boost speed, which means that Charizard will outspeed me. It already has incredible speed, and immediately turn one it goes for a fire blast, and at this point I'm, I'm gasping, but thankfully it didn't crit, and you can see my boosted special from growth that really stymies the damage, even the strongest super effective fire move in the game. Anyway, I put the Zard to sleep, I charge up a sky attack, it doesn't do quite half damage, and I'm unsure if this is a range, but rather than risk another sky attack and taking that chance, I do use one Mega Drain to kind of get, get that little buffer of health in between, so that the next sky attack will ensure that it's lethal damage. Now Charizard cooperates with me by not waking up from his little nappy nap, and I've done it. Bellsprout. Minimum battles. Wow. Overall, I end up finishing the game at level 63 with a 4 hour 46 minutes of in-game time and frankly, that's pretty amazing. There are at least 3-4 to four times I've talked about in the video where we could have saved several in-game minutes including that Dragonite struggle battle. I know that this time could be significantly better and if I ever wanted to try this run for a third time, I have no doubt that this could be in the 4 hours and 20 minute range, 4 hour 30 range. And this is significant, I only bring this up because J-Rose 11's Ghastly Time, which everyone considers to be the best pre-evolved Pokemon by a large margin, wasn't even that fast. So overall, Bellsprout was incredible. Any Pokemon that can beat the game in minimum battles is impressive, and Bellsprout, in my opinion, is even more so because its move pool is awful. It's really shallow, it's just bad, his move pool is awful. And I didn't even use a single TM until I got to the Agatha fight. However, even though you have to rank Bellsprout in the top few Pokemons for these runs, I don't think that it'll be at the very, very top. I, it can't dethrone Ghastly because you gotta take into account how much luck was required to get past certain battles. A Pokemon that solely relies on 75% chance of sleep with sleep powder as a crutch and wrap for a lot of damage in the early game, uh, there's a significant amount of resets to kind of make it through all the battles despite doing the minimum. Since the problems start really early, all the way from the, the rival battle, the very first bug trainer in Viridian Forest, it's hard to say that Bellsprout's an S tier Pokemon, but I can comfortably say it belongs in the A tier, which for now, for me, it sits up there alone above Clefairy and Slowpoke. And I'm not sure what Pokemon I'll be doing next. I may not do a pre evolved Pokemon, I might try something new. But I think you guys can expect another video next week. Anyway, this has been another solo run of Pokemon Red and Blue. And as usual, if you made it this far, come on, man. I, bring it in. I really appreciate you. Any feedback is welcome. And I'll catch you guys in the next video.